Well, today we're going to talk about uh, doing our part requires a great purpose. We're wrapping up the Doing Our Part series today, and we're talking about how that if you're going to do your part, you must have, you must discover a great purpose in life. If Avalon Church is to grow and reach people with the gospel and to move to a new facility and to do better at our mission, we must discover and know our purpose. I believe we've discovered our purpose, but we must know what the purpose is. And for those of you that wonder, if you're new, uh, if you've been around a while, you've heard it a lot, but it is bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And, And what that means is our primary job as a church is to bring people. We want to invite people to church. Uh, We say inviting is evangelism. We want people to come to know Christ. We want people to be saved. We want people to get baptized, all right? That's the bringing people part. Uh, Wherever they are uh, is the part about our attitude. You ever been a part of a church or seen a church or knew of a church that kind of had the philosophy that if you like the same 200-year-old music that we like, if you dress the same strange way that we dress, if you smell like us and look like us, then you can be a part. But that's not how Jesus operated. In fact, Jesus, uh, when it came to the religious elite, those that thought that they did not need God, that thought that they did not need forgiveness, he said, you know what? That's not what I'm a part of. But I came to seek and to save that which is lost. And if you ever have admitted to yourself that you're a sinner, if you've ever admitted to yourself that you've sinned, that you've failed, then I've got good news for you. Jesus specializes in people just like you. And that's why we say at Avalon Church uh, that Avalon Church is the perfect place for imperfect people. And if you are perfect or think you're perfect, please don't come to Avalon Church. You'll screw up what we've got going here, all right? So, uh, but there are no perfect people. We know that. And so that's why we say Avalon Church is a perfect place for imperfect people. But any organization or individual that has no defined purpose will drift into a meaningless existence. I want you to think about what I just said. If you have not discovered your purpose in life, if you're not aware of what God has called you to do, then the sad acknowledgement that we must make is this, that unless you discover that purpose, you're going to live a meaningless existence. We're going to talk about that today. But God designed you for a purpose, and that's good news. God knew you before you were ever born. God thought about you before he ever formed the universe, before he ever put the sun in the sky, before he ever put the stars in the universe, before he ever created the giraffes and the hippopotamus and the rhinos and the lions and the worthless little chihuahuas. I'm not sure why he created those. Uh, but uh, anyway, if you carry one of those around, my wife has said that she wants to get a little tiny dog and then she wants to get one of those little pocket, I call it a pocketbook, I'm not sure what it's called, but she wants to get one of those little things and carry that little, that little thing around in it. Like, you know, I'm like, what is that, a rat? Okay, but no, she wants to do that. We don't have that yet and uh, hopefully I can hold off for a few more years before she gets that, but nevertheless, God did design you for a purpose. And you have a great purpose. He thought about you before you were born. Jesus thought about you when he was on the cross. He knew your name, and he has a purpose for your life. Now, not everyone surrenders to his purpose. Not everyone follows his purpose. But God has a purpose for your life. You're not an accident. Maybe your parents did not plan you, but God planned you nevertheless. And so God has a purpose and a plan for your life. And so today... We're going to look at a passage of Scripture in the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes was written by King Solomon. Um, The Bible tells us that he was the wisest man that ever lived. The wisest man that ever lived. Um, I'm not sure how wise he was. He wasn't perfect, we know that, because he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Now you say, what is that? Well, like this little boy that went to Sunday school and his teacher told him about Solomon and he came home and his mom said, what did you learn in church today? He said, well, we learned about Solomon. She said, what did you learn about Solomon? He said, well, 
He had 700 wives and 300 porcupines. So a concubine was a wife that did not have the, her children did not have the right of inheritance. So Solomon had a thousand wives. Now, I thought he was supposed to be the wisest man that ever lived, but nevertheless, maybe, maybe he was. But we're going to look at the wisdom of King Solomon today. And he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes from the perspective of a person that did not have a purpose in life. He wrote the first part of this book from the perspective of a person that was not serving God, that was not following God, that did not have this divine purpose that they had discovered in their life. Now, in the end, he told what the real purpose of life was. And so we're going to begin reading in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse number 2. Once again, he's writing from the perspective of a frustrated person that has been successful in life but not successful in their relationship with God. So I want you to listen to what he said. Everything is meaningless, says the teacher, completely meaningless. What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets and then hurries around to rise again. And the wind blows south and then turns north and around and around it goes, blowing in circles. Rivers run into the sea but the sea is never full. And then the water returns again to the rivers and flows out again to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. History merely repeats itself. It's all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. Sometimes people say, here's something new, but actually it's old. Nothing is ever truly new. We don't remember what happened in the past. And in the future generations, no one will remember what we are doing now. I, the teacher, was king of Israel. I lived in Jerusalem. I devoted myself to search for understanding and to explore by wisdom everything being done under the sun. I soon discovered that God has dealt a tragic existence to the human race. I observed everything going on under the sun and really... It's all meaningless, like chasing the wind. What is wrong cannot be made right, and what is missing cannot be recovered. Was this not a sad commentary? Was this not a sad um, way of saying how he looked at life? Man, what what a tragic way to live. My mom and dad are here today. Would you guys stand real quick? Um, Let's give them a hand. Thank you guys for being here with us today. My mom and dad, uh, of course, had a tremendous influence. You've heard me tell many, many stories about our family. They have the greatest influence on my life for good. And um, they have certainly made an impact on the kingdom of God themselves. And I'm very thankful for them. Uh, But uh, I'll, I'll tell this story. My dad and I went over to visit a man that lived across the street from us. His name was Gil White. You've heard me tell his story before. Gil White died at 99 years of age. And I remember sitting on his porch, and my dad was talking to him. He said, Gil, you need to receive Jesus as your Savior. And I remember that man looking at my dad. He said, well, he said, I read this book every day, so I'm about the Bible. And he said, I've come to this conclusion. There's no hope for anybody. And that's kind of what Solomon was saying here. Gil White, that man that made a lot of money in his life, He was successful as a farmer in his life, but he was not successful in his relationship with God. In spite of reading the Bible on a regular basis, he said there is no hope in life. And I believe that's exactly how Solomon felt. At least he was writing this perspective uh, to give us an idea of what it's like when we don't have a relationship with God, when we don't have a purpose in life. I want to give you just a few thoughts that are what I call false perspectives or lies of the enemy. Now, most likely all of us have felt some of these at some point in our life, but I want you to understand they're lies. The Bible says that the devil is the uh, father of lies. He is a liar and a murderer from the beginning. Why would we believe what he says? He says, we're not good enough. We're not smart enough. We're not strong enough. 
and, and he says, you've done too much. You've gone too far. There's no way you could have a relationship with God. There's no way God would use someone like you. If they found out what you really are or what you have done in your past, they wouldn't let you walk into that church. Lies. Jesus When you receive him, you know what he says about us? And the word of God, the truth of the word of God says that we are more than conquerors. It says that we, because of the Holy Spirit of God, that we are filled with love and we're filled with patience and we're filled with joy. You say, I'm not always filled with joy. Well, that's because you haven't listened to the Holy Spirit. He will fill you if you let him. The Bible tells us that we are children of God. We are sons of God. We've been adopted into his family. We have every promise that was given to Jesus that had been given to us. Thank God. Those are the truths that we need to remember. But we remember the lies. It's funny, isn't it, how that you can have 99 people tell you you did a good job and one person tells you you didn't, and that's what we focus on. Isn't that crazy? I mean, we just get all upset over the one person that said something negative. Well, I believe that all of us have been victim or been guilty of feeling this way of these lies of the enemy. Here's lie number one. Life feels empty. Solomon said everything is meaningless. An empty life is without purpose, and it leads to feelings of uselessness and no motivation and no enthusiasm. Life feels empty. Now, we've all been there. If you've lived long enough, you've had enough trouble that sometimes you wonder why. Why? Why this? Why now? Why me? And the truth is, life sometimes feels empty, but we must reject the lies of the enemy and put our eyes back on Jesus to find the truth that God says that life is not empty, but it's filled with meaning. It's filled with purpose when we follow him. Here's a second lie that Solomon tells us. Uh, Life seems wearisome, verses four through eight. He said, everything is wearisome beyond description. Now, this is not just the perspective of a person that worked really hard and went home and collapsed on the couch. There's something good about being tired at the end of a work day. There's something good about, there's something that feels good about accomplishing something. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about this feeling of depression. And sometimes we need medication to get over depression. I I realize that. But sometimes we need a good old fashioned dose of getting right with God. Sometimes we need a good old fashioned dose of the word of God into our life. Sometimes we need a good old fashioned dose of our faith being put back on Jesus and our faith growing because we trust him. But sometimes life seems wearisome. You ever been there? You ever just felt like that it wasn't worth it? All this effort I've been putting into it, why am I trying so hard? Nobody cares. We feel that life is wearisome sometimes. And then the third lie is that life appears unsatisfying. Verse number eight. No matter how much we see, we're never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we're not content. Now, that's the perspective of a person that does not have the right motivation from the right purpose with their relationship with God. The fact is, life can be unsatisfying. I've known people that had everything that life had to offer, so to speak, from a, from a worldly standpoint at least. They had a great job good family, beautiful home, money in the bank, and yet they felt that life was completely unsatisfying. I remember standing in the driveway of a friend of mine a number of years ago, and he was extremely successful. He and his wife made about a half a million dollars a year, and I know for some of you that's not, nothing but pocket change, but uh, you make sure you come to the banquet tonight if that's your case. All right, so... The truth is, though, I stood in his driveway and we were talking. He used to go to church and he didn't now. And he used to serve God and he no longer did. And I remember standing in that driveway and he said, you know what? He said, I make all this money. I got this beautiful home. I got a beautiful wife. I've got a beautiful child. And he said, I may be the most miserable man in the world. You know, if all you look at is what this life has to offer, 
you're going to be disappointed. Oh, don't get me wrong. God made beauty everywhere. Beauty in nature. I love seeing the ocean. I love seeing the mountains. I love watching a sunset. I love looking up at the stars at night and just remember that God, when he was creating, read the book of Genesis, the first few chapters of the book of Genesis. And I love this about God. He it was talking about all these spectacular things that he was creating. And it was just like a little tagline, a little byline. And it said, oh, and he made these stars also. <laughs> I mean, how can you just like, oh, and he also made the stars. The fact is, God makes some beautiful things, but life can be unsatisfying if you don't have a right purpose with God. Another thing Solomon wrote about was that life becomes insignificant. Verse 11, it says, we don't remember what happened in the past and the future generations. No one will remember what we're doing now. When we only focus on the immediate and the earthly, then we will lead a life of insignificance. And I'm going to tell you, no matter how much money you make, and I hope all of you make all the money you can stand, I hope all of you will be blessed to the point that you will still serve God. I've seen a lot of people in life, they start making a lot of money and they don't need God anymore. And uh, they need, you know, whatever it is that they can buy with their money. And then they realize that money cannot truly satisfy. Now, we always say that money doesn't make you happy. And that's true. Money is a tool. Uh, it is neither good nor bad. The Bible says the love of money is what is the root of all evil. And so money can't make you happy, um, but it can buy happiness for a short period of time. We all know that. I mean, you know, if you get a new boat, you're probably going to be happy, right? Uh, but probably only for a little while if you're not serving God with your life. But he said, life seems insignificant. And here's what I know. You can spend all of your life being successful working your fingers to the bone. And when you get to the top of the ladder of success, if you do not have a relationship with God, you're going to discover that the ladder was leaning against the wrong wall the entire time. So don't be that person. Life becomes insignificant. And then Solomon said, life feels hopelessly broken. Hopelessly broken. Listen to what he said. What is wrong cannot be made right. What is missing cannot be recovered. He was saying there's no hope. There's no way that things are going to get better. You ever had that outlook in life? Well, I'll tell you what, you watch the news. There's nothing in this world that's getting any better. Well, that may be true, but thank God Jesus is coming again. And that Jesus will make things right one day when he returns, okay? We don't have to worry about it. Uh, life is not hopeless. Life is not broken when we have Christ as our Savior. So stop believing the lies of the enemy and realize that God has a purpose for your life and that nothing else will take the place of a God-given purpose. Solomon came to that conclusion, by the way. Listen to what he wrote at the end of the book. Uh, he says in, in chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, the end of the matter, all has been heard, fear God and keep his commandments. Fear God, in other words, worship Him, have a relationship with God, and follow Him. Do you know that every command that God gives us is rooted in His love for us? It's not rooted in trying to make us earn our salvation, earn our way to heaven. That's not possible. That's only by the grace of God. But when we worship God and obey the Word of God, our life is better. He said, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Now, I don't know about you, but that verse 14 terrifies me. For God will bring every deed into judgment and every secret thing, whether good or evil. Now, if you've read that and you don't truly understand the gospel, then it terrifies you. Because you're thinking about, well, when I get to heaven... Maybe God's going to have this big old film of my life. And he's going to reveal all these things that I did wrong. But that is not what God does. Now, it will be true that for those that stand before the great white throne judgment, in other words, those that are not saved, when you stand before God, if you're not a follower of Christ, then yes, you will be judged and your works will be exposed. But you know what? According to the grace of God and justification and salvation, you know what Jesus did for us on the cross he not only paid for our sins 
and purchased us with his blood. But he forgave our sins and allowed us to be put in right position with God, with the Heavenly Father. And as a result of that, what I have when I follow Christ is justification and grace. You say, well, you mean if a, if a believer stands before God, then God's not going to point out all their sins? No, he's not. You know why? Because as far as God is concerned, if you're a believer, you have no sin because you are justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. And when God sees you, he sees the blood of his son. He sees that your penalty was paid. Your salvation was purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. So when you stand before God, and the reason that's true, God cannot allow sin into his presence. If God saw our sin or recognized our sin or remembered our sin, we could not go to heaven. We could not be in right relationship with him. But because of Jesus, we don't have to worry. All we see, all we wonder about, all we have to worry about is the grace of God. So let me read that to you again. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. And that is absolutely true if you're not a believer, if you're not a follower of Christ. But if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, when you stand before God, you know what he's going to say? He's going to say, all I see is the blood of my son. That's why it says in the book of Isaiah that no weapon formed against you will prosper. And nothing that the enemy tries to raise against you or accuse you of is going to prosper. It's not going to succeed. You know what? The old devil is going to be there at the judgment. And he's going to be trying to point out all the wrong you've ever done. And Jesus is our advocate. You read the book of Isaiah and it describes this courtroom scene in heaven. And it's a beautiful thing. And you know what Jesus is going to do? He's going to shut the old devil down. He's going to shut him up once and for all. Because every time he tries to say, you look at Richie Miller and he wants to try to point out my sin, then all Jesus will do is look to the Father and said, yes, but he's been redeemed. He's been justified. He's been forgiven. He no longer has any sin. And thank God that because of Jesus, we'll be able to go into the presence of God. So God's purpose is for me to live my life in preparation for eternity. That's really it. You want to know what the purpose of your life is? It is for you to live your life in preparation for eternity. Solomon also wrote this in Ecclesiastes 3.11. God has planted eternity in the human heart. Billy Graham used to say it this way. There is a God-shaped hole in your soul that nothing but a relationship with God will fill. And I believe that's what that verse means, that God has put eternity in the human heart. In other words, you know that there's a God. You know that he's a loving God. You know by looking around you and what all God has done for you, you know you can get angry at him, and some people do. And some people stay there. And you can be upset, and you don't need to worry about vertical venting to God in prayer. He can handle it. He knows what you're thinking anyway. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you today that because of Jesus, you don't have to worry about it. Because of him, you can understand that God made you as an eternal soul. In other words, you're going to live somewhere forever. And the decision is up to you. I heard one guy say it this way. God will not force you into heaven. He'll not force you to go to heaven. You have to receive Christ as your Savior. Well, let me just give you four very quick thoughts about how to prepare for eternity. If your purpose in life is to live your life in preparation for eternity, then what do I do to do that? What do I do to prepare for eternity? Number one, receive Jesus. That's as simple as I can make it. Receive Jesus as your Savior. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And all you must do is turn to him. John 1, verses 12 and 13. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of the blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So in other words, he says none of your earthly efforts is what makes you a son or a daughter of God. It's not your goodness. It's not your good deeds, but rather it's the will of God. It is 
the plan of God for your life. Receive Jesus. Today, if you've not done that, I want to encourage you to do it today. And I'm going to give you a chance to respond at the end of the message today. But I want to give you a chance to pray to receive Christ right now. You don't have to wait. You know, the Bible is very clear. It says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you want to receive Jesus, you can in your seat right where you are, in your home right where you're watching from today. You can say something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And I'm asking you to forgive me and to save me right now. And I'm asking you for the faith to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you say that to God, if you'll pray that prayer, he promises to save you. And at the end of the service today, I'm going to give you a chance to respond to that. But if you want to prepare for eternity, you've got to receive Jesus. Number two, you've got to use your time for Jesus. Colossians 4, 5, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Do you redeem the time or do you just waste time? Are you redeeming the time of your life? Use your time for Jesus. And then number three, use your talent for Jesus. Acts 20, 24, but none of these things move me. This is the apostle Paul. He says, neither count I my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I've received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. What Paul was saying was, I'm going to use my ability for God. I wonder, are you using your ability for God? Now, God's given you ability. You're to use it at work. You're to use it at home. You're to use it in your personal life, but you're also to use it for God. Are you using it? Are you using your talent and your time? And then finally, number four, you need to use your treasure for Jesus. You see, God gives us resources. And he expects us to use them for him. And he expects us to invest in the kingdom of God. First Timothy chapter 6 verses 18 and 19. This was Paul writing and telling the rich folk. Okay? Rich folks. By the way, do you know that if you own a car, you're in the top 10% of the wealthiest people in the world? Do you know that if you make $35,000 a year in household income, I'm talking about household income, you're in the top 10% of the wealthiest people in the world, actually more like in the top 5% of the wealthiest people in the world, what would you call one out of 100? What would you call the person that's got more money than 99 other people in the room? You'd call that person rich, right? You know what most of the world calls us? Rich. And so it really applies to us. Here's what he says. Tell them, the rich folk, to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and should give happily to those in need. Always ready to share with others whatever God has given them. By doing this, they will be storing up real treasure for themselves in heaven. It is the only safe investment for eternity. And they will be living a fruitful Christian life down here as well. So God says one of the ways that you can prepare for eternity is to use your treasure for him. Well, if you're going to live in light of eternity, if you're going to live in preparation for eternity, you got to receive Jesus, use your time, your talent, and your treasure for him. And then you've got to accept that God has a purpose for your life. Do you know what it's called when you don't live for eternity? It's called secularism. Secularism. And that word comes from the Latin word seculum, And it means only to be interested in what's happening today. That's all I'm worried about, what's happening right now. And God does not want you to live that way. He does not want you to waste your life. But he wants you to live in light of eternity. And so I'm saying if you want to be wise, use as much as you can of your time, your talent, your treasure for Jesus. And when you do that, God promises to bless you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help all of us today. Help us to use our life for you. Help us to live in light of eternity. Help us to live our lives in preparation for eternity. That is our great purpose. Lord, for those that may be drifting today, I pray that you bring them back to this purpose. For those that don't know you yet, maybe they prayed a moment ago to receive Christ. Maybe they need to do it now. 
I pray that they do that just now. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be blessed and to follow you with all of our heart. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.